Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, and on today's show, we welcome Prashant Mata, general partner at Panache Ventures. We get Prashant to share his journey over to Panache and how he transitioned through various roles in venture capital, tech, and business strategy to finally becoming a GP. Next, we take a look back at Prashant's time at Omer's Ventures and how his approach to investing and working with founders has evolved and the lessons he learned working alongside some amazing investors and founders during his time there. Next, we dig into the changes in the Canadian venture capital scene since Prashant entered the industry and how the recent market downturns have impacted Panache Ventures' investment strategies over the two funds they've raised. We jump into why Panache Ventures focuses on pre-seed and seed stage investments and what they're looking for in startup founders for potential success. And lastly, we discuss the importance of diversity in startups and how Panache Ventures supports founders along the different stages of development. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's interview with Prashant Mata. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Prashant. Thanks for having me, Matt. Great to see you. Prashant, you've been working and supporting the venture capital ecosystem for quite some time, and your background is quite impressive, you know, given your various roles in venture capital, technology, and business strategy. So maybe for our audience who don't know so much about you, can you share some highlights in your career path and how you ended up in the current role as a GP at Panache Ventures? Sure, happy to. Um, as I hear from most of my VC friends, we we all have taken random paths into this industry. Uh, so my career started in management consulting, uh, tech and product. Uh, I spent some time out in Korea and the Bay Area with Samsung. Learned a lot. Eventually realized there was lots happening in Toronto you know, in the 2013, 2014 timeframe, moved back and joined Omer's Ventures. I was, honestly, I was, I was going to join a startup as a COO and, and uh, my now friends at Omer's convinced me to, uh, to join the investment team. So yeah, started my Canadian venture investing back then. Um, and then 2018, joined the team with, uh, with my now partners at Panache. We started the fund. It's been, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> to say the least. I mean, your time at Omer's Ventures, I remember when you were there with Bram Sugarman, you know, John and the team were there. You guys were really the epicenter of where a lot of successful breakout companies would want to go and meet with. During your time at, you know, at one of the leading Canadian venture players at the time, what was that like? And how did your approach to investing evolve from your time when you started at Omer's until the time you left to join Panache. Oh my gosh, it's, uh, man, it was a complete mind shift. Uh, I mean, I went from, I did do some early stage investing at Overs, but I went from my last investment being a Series D to writing pre-seed checks. I remember in 2018, looking at a pre-seed company, and I was like, where's the financial model? And then I realized, holy crap, <laughs> none of that really exists. And uh, so look, I, I think all in all, uh, I've, I've always enjoyed the early stage. And for me, it was a great transition. John had put together really a dream team. I mean, it's amazing. You look at the Owers alumni and uh, man, there, there've been so many funds that were created coming out of the Owers team and, and startups as well. So uh, I had a great time, uh, learned a lot, understanding and learning about the venture methodology and doing deals and working with operators. And, and I was lucky enough to be on some boards Give me some real insights into how you scale a business from zero to to millions, and that's a knowledge I think is pretty unique to to my skill set, which uh, which a lot of my portfolio companies and founders I work with kind of appreciate at the pre seed stage. So yeah, it wasn't an easy transition, I would say. It was a, it was a big mind shift change for me, but uh, you know it's been it's been great. Yeah, I mean, what you experience is what we tell our analysts and associates and. Frankly, anyone who calls me for advice on how to break into venture, what I say is exactly what you experienced is try to have the broadest aperture to see the most amount of opportunities. Whether you close on them or not, or move it across the finish line doesn't really matter. It's the opportunity to see the most amount so you know what good versus bad is or what good versus great is. And that's what you got to see during your time at Omer's. Isn't it the case? Yeah, I completely agree, Matt. I mean, uh, I I tell a lot of our uh, junior folks on our team joined us, you've got to see at least 200 deals before you can uh, build a a framework in your head about what works and doesn't work at your specific stage. You know, I I think in general, you're right. There are really two ways to, to, to get into our industry. One is you do the operator grind and you're, you know, you exit or you're successful. Or second is kind of what, what I did was you start as an analyst and you do that grind and you eventually build a track record to have the opportunity to be a GP. So I think your, your advice is, is sound and uh, that's kind of what I tell our 
our uh, our associates. You've got to look as many deals as possible. Don't worry about the close rates quite yet and focus on founders and helping them and you'll learn the rest. Yeah, we'll get into that stuff. But, you know, you moved over to Panache, you know, at a time when the firm was just getting kicked off. You know, how did that opportunity come around to join as a GP? And why did you decide to launch the new fund with the team there? Yeah, I, I think it was a lot of it. It was um, great ideas coming together. We, uh, I, I had not worked with uh, my partners uh, at that point, and we were just getting to know each other. But we, we all saw the same opportunity, which was nobody was doing pre-seed investing in Canada. I'm talking 2017 now. It was a fairly well understood stage in the U.S. There was a lot of, you know, excitement around it. Uh, what we recognized was none of the early stage funds in Canada were doing pre-seed. And, and what, when I say pre-seed, a lot of it is pre-product and pre-revenue, right? So most of the seed stage investing back then was, was happening on a, on a revenue traction based approach. Uh, and a lot of the angels uh, were getting involved, which was pretty cool. So there was a fair bit of angel activity, but no no institutional fund focusing all of their efforts at that stage. So we saw a gap, you know, we went for it. We didn't really know, what, you know, how the strategy was going to play out. Frankly, fund one was mainly to prove capital market fit. Is this a real stage? Can you execute on that strategy? Can you generate returns? And and so I think Fund 1 helped us solidify that, that approach. We learned a lot and, and kind of evolved into Fund 2, which we recently closed. Uh, but yeah, I, I think coming together was is a lot of it was random. It was, we were all looking at pre-seed, trying to do something. I was going to do a smaller microphone. Pat and Mike, uh, my, my partners now, Mike Sigilski and Pat, Pat Lohr, were also thinking, Sam, coming off of 500 startups. And so it just ended up being us working together and, uh, and going through the initial build phase of Fund One. Yeah, I mean, right place, right time for sure for you and for the team, you know, spinning off from 500 Startups Canada. Maybe we can jump into how the partnership sort of breaks down their roles, geography focus, and how the fund is sort of made up in terms of uh, strategy across the Canadian landscape of investments in the pre seed stage. We're kind of the only national pre seed stage fund. Uh, when I say that, what I mean is with presence in four core markets, Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, and Vancouver. And that's always been the strategy from the get-go. We were lucky to have Pat in Calgary, Mike and the team in Montreal, and I was in, in, in Toronto. Pat was really covering Vancouver for us back then. We, we then added Chris Newman in Vancouver. Uh, he's been a great addition to the team and the partnership with Fund2. The vision was always we want to be the national scale, mainly because we think the best Pre-seed deals are are very much founder bets, and and part of that is being in the market where these founders are. Yes, you can be in Toronto and fly to Vancouver and do a deal in Vancouver, but you really need to be in the mix of what's happening in the community. So that's been part of the core strategy. We the way we operate is each partner is responsible for their geography. Uh, however, we usually have two to three partners in every deal, especially when it comes to domain knowledge. So, for example, I've done a lot of investments in fintech. So usually when, when there's a fintech deal involved, I'm, 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 I'm taking a look uh, from, from, from my perspective and kind of sharing my expertise there. Uh, so very collaborative. What has been challenging, although the pandemic kind of helped with that a little bit, was a distributed partnership. And, and you've, you know, you've, Matt, you've gone through this, so I want to I I learn from you a little bit here on based on your experience. Matt, it is tough to keep... <laughs> Keep, keep the team together when you're not in the same place, right? So uh, I think we've put a lot of hard work to, to keep uh, the team you know, on the same page and, and make sure we're gelling well, but it's been tough. Uh, and pandemic helped because that kind of changed the way the companies operate. Um, and so we do spend a lot of time together and help each other out in, in, in different geographies, and that's part of the philosophy. Yeah, I think for us, you know, we started in office at our Ripple tank in the beginning, as you know, and that helped us set the sort of precedent for teamwork, communication, collaboration, stuff like that. Transitioning to remote was not as difficult with the existing team, but as we layered on more employees and more analysts and associates over the years, it has become more difficult. And the way that we've solved that is by putting in more structure, more templates, a better onboarding and coaching and sort of mentorship model with more async and daily syncs with team members. And I think that's uh, been important. And also just spending time together in office or at events and stuff is, is important. For young GPs like you and I as well, it's important for us to also have 
advisors and mentors in other funds who are uh, managing partners to ask them for their advice on how they manage their team and expand their team, especially in a remote world. So I don't know about you, but I've had some really great mentors and advisors at other GP funds. Yeah, likewise. I, I think uh, that's the beauty of our ecosystem. It's it's smallish, obviously, compared to the U.S., but a lot of collaboration in in, in most, I would say, on most days, and uh, a lot of good opportunities to learn from each other. Yeah, I mean, you guys have had some great success with Fund One and Fund Two. I believe Fund One was around fifty, and the second one was almost double the size, if not more. You know, maybe explain how Panache Ventures has focused on pre-seed and seed and why that seed stage and pre-seed is the focus and how your portfolio model and construction has evolved from fund one to fund two. Fund one for us, like I said, was is is prove out capital market fit. Is the stage real? The pre-seed stage, is it real? Are there enough good quality opportunities? And it was a 58 million fund. We were investing up to half a million. And what we've done is because we're so early, think of us as top of funnel for the Canadian ecosystem, right? That's what we do. Uh, so that when companies get to seed and A and, and so on, our, our friends can in, in Canada and US can fund them. And so Fund One was really prove out the model. We have a diversified portfolio strategy, not because we love having 100 portfolio companies. Uh, it's because of math. You know, it's the, the conversion ratio from pre-seed to seed and A drops quite significantly. So if you look at our Fund One, top 30 companies out of 100 is pretty much where most of the money is, right? Which is not so different from a concentrated seed fund of our size. So I think Fund One was, was a great learning opportunity for us, learn from our what works, what doesn't work, and then pivot into, into uh, Fund Two, which, which is a $100 million fund. And feel pretty grateful we, we, we raised it in a good time. And I think what's changed from Fund One to Two, and you and I have chatted about this a little bit, is, is a bit more focus on ownership. You know, when, when we look at our, uh, some of our winners out of Fund One, we own enough that could return the fund, but we would have loved to own more. <laughs> I think part of the change with Fund Two is bigger first checks, more follow-on capital. We're aiming for 10% ownership rather than, you know, what was 5% in Fund, fund One. But the, the core and the philosophy of the fund has not changed, right? We're still a pre-seed, early seed stage fund. That's core to who we are. Uh, and that's not changed. Yeah, for sure. I think everyone sort of realized that ownership is key to driving, you know, real fund DPI across, uh, you know, the early stage landscape. We obviously talk about this a lot. We wrote about it. And I think a lot of people are starting to pick up on like, you know, this is not just a game of finding power law returns, but also managing your portfolio as a whole and not looking at each individual investment as its own. Maybe we can speak to about how you had, you know, some exits in the fund one. You know, what did that mean for you guys? And um, what did your LPs think about that in terms of returning as LPs for fund two? Yeah, look, I, I think exit certainly helped uh, to to raise our fund two. You know, I think you and your team have done really good research and work on the DPI piece that you're talking about. And we certainly lack in that area when it comes to the Canadian ecosystem, um, broadly speaking, Canadian venture. I, I think we're getting there. So with fund one, the, the few exits we had back then in 2021, we were like, oh my gosh, these are early exits. We wish these founders held out for another year or two, but <laughs> felt pretty grateful those deals got done and, and helped us return almost 20% of the fund. And so I, I, I think DPI was important for us to raise fund too, uh, especially for a pre-seed stage fund. When we go to institutional LPs, a lot of them ask us, hey, listen, you're a pre-seed fund you know, what's your view on generating DPI and, and how you guys think about your fund cycles versus a seed for an A fund, right? An A fund has a 10-year cycle, a pre-seed fund also has a 10-year cycle. So how do we, how do we you know, think about, about your fund? And so, so I, I think it was certainly a learning experience. And my, my view is, statistically speaking, if you have a big enough portfolio, DPI should happen. It's just the venture math. We know 70% of companies are eventually going to go to zero. But if out of that 70%, a handful of can have great exits, we return some capital, it's really the top you know, 30% uh, that will drive returns. And so uh, I, I think for us, having those base hits were, were pretty important as we continue to build with our top 10, top 20 companies in, that are still growing in the current portfolio. 
<laughs> the way I like to explain it to other VCs just starting out or LPs is like fun. One is like your prototype, your product solution fit MVP kind of fun to prove that the model couldn't work and capital can be deployed. And fun two and then fun three is when you start to refine really your focus and strategy on generating those those really big fun return or outcomes. You know, but how did the run up in 2021 in venture capital impact your firm's capital allocation decisions and the framework you guys l- thought about going into fund two and maybe some lessons you learned from that market madness to think about changing your strategy towards follow-ons and secondaries and things like that. Yeah. And, and Matt, I still remember us uh, chatting about a few deals in 2021 and we were both were like, oh man, this is bonkers. <laughs> and so back then it hurt because we passed and missed out on a whole bunch of deals in 2021. And Back then, we were like, what's what's going on? We were in kind of the fourth year, almost fourth year of our investment period. So feel pretty lucky that we were not a 2021 vintage uh, doing expensive seed deals. It was a tough learning lesson. On one hand, uh, it was tough to pass on deals, uh, which we thought were great entrepreneurs, but expensive. And on the other hand, it did help a lot of our later stage companies raise a lot of money and grow faster. So luckily, 2021, we didn't do as many new investments, not lack of trying. And we took that as a signal of how hot the market was to go raise our fund too. We didn't really need to raise fund two until 2022. And as we were looking at the data and market, we, we recognized, listen, there's so much uh, money in, in the market in venture, we should probably raise ourselves. You know, we're, we're telling founders, it's a good time to go raise money. We should listen to the advice we, we give founders. And so... That's kind of how kickstarted our, our fund two process in kind of Q3 of, of 2021. Uh, and the timing kind of ended up working for us. That's really great advice for you to take uh, for yourself. As you guys are telling founders to go raise, you guys looked at each other and said, we should be also raising. I, I think part of our, our approach ended up being in fund one, when, when, we, when we had our first, second close, a lot of it was institutional money. And, and then we followed on and topped up with angels and family offices. With fund two, we used the other approach. We went first to family offices and angels because the market was so hot. And, if, and then we had a massive first close, which ended up pushing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the institutionals to jump in. So, you know, feel pretty grateful. We, we got it done uh, in, in a good time. You know, as we look at fund two and kind of how we go from here, it's We've got to make some great investments over the next few years and and uh, generate some good returns. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have to ask though. You know, what are you looking for now when you look at these pre seed companies when it comes to deciding if it makes the grade for what a panache deal looks like? Like, what is a perfect panache deal now for Fund Two? Founder, founder, founder. I mean, at the stage where we operate, it's all about founder market fit. Um, most of the companies we invest in at the pre seed stage. Our MVP, no revenue, early users. Uh, we spend a lot of time getting to know the founders and their market hypothesis. We do our own work on on market hypothesis, kind of building our own research around it. But most of it, really, 80% of it is founders. I think if I look at the last year or so, there's been a lot of good momentum in AI, of course, although very still kind of very frothy and hyped up. Uh, but lot, lots of good opportunities there, climate, fintech, DevOps. Those have all been good categories for us uh, over the last call of the year or so. A lot of the the pandemic darling sectors like e-com and so on have, have gone through a little bit of a slowdown. So I think we're, we're following the smartest people. And, and our view is you find and invest in the smartest people and they'll tell you what's next. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I've told our team, nobody at the founder level of a pre seed company, as they're just getting started, likely knows who we are as a fund. We're not that big of a brand name for us to be, you know, recognized right off the bat. So we have to find them. You know, we have to get in front of them before they even think about putting pen to paper. So how are you going about finding the founder, the perfect founder, before they find you? It's a it's a mix of a few few tactics, which which uh, you know your team does a great job as well. With is a lot of outbound, right? I think pandemic showed us that we need to be a lot more outbound oriented. Pre pandemic, a lot of the sourcing activities were still very much in person, events, referrals, accelerators, and so on. Pandemic happened, and we were all stuck at home. <laughs> You're like, holy crap! How are we going to generate deal flow? Uh, so it was it was the nature of. We just had to figure out new ways to find entrepreneurs and founders. That led us to a lot, a lot more outbound activities, uh, 
like scraping LinkedIn and Twitter, which almost, I feel like now every fund does that. So perhaps not unique anymore. And now like post pandemic, uh, as the world opens up, it's a combination of, you know, old tactics and new tactics. And so while our outbound strategies have, you know, probably dropped from 70% in the pandemic to maybe 40%, it's still a big part of our sourcing efforts. As we think about kind of the fun and we how we operate, how do we find these founders? You're absolutely right, man. We have to get to them first because if we don't, a U.S. fund will get there first or YC will get there first. And then, you know, it's kind of too late for us. For us, it's been exactly where you're saying, get to these founders first. And there are many different approaches that, that we've tried. Well, you guys obviously brought on Chris Newman. Maybe explain to your audience, you know, how that relationship came about, the kind of merger with Chris's team and his, you know, investment platform and the strategy going forward with Chris on the, on the West coast. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty unique. I mean, uh, b- back then this is 20, what are we talking here? 2020, 2021. I think we were just trying to figure out how are we going to support our portfolio at scale because we were kind of still building our portfolio. It's a large portfolio. We're four partners or three partners back then team of seven, you know, how are we going to support these companies as they grow? And Chris um, had worked with Pat and Mike, my other partners at 500. He used to run their uh, global data and AI practice uh, in SF. And he had moved back to to BC, to Vancouver, after 10 plus years in the Valley. And so it just felt like the right combination of what he was doing and, and what we were doing and we wanted to do. And so uh, we brought him on as, as our partner in Vancouver. He runs a lot of our, call it, accelerator-like programming that we offer our portfolio companies, especially the fundraising bootcamp that he runs on a quarterly basis. And that's been an immensely, immensely helpful to our founders. Uh, and that helps me kind of support portfolio companies at scale, because otherwise I would be doing a lot of that fundraising coaching one-on-one. The great partnership so far, he's, he's done a great job building his track record and his brand and his capabilities. And we're, we're really lucky to have him on the team. Yeah, I mean, you spoke about having companies get to YC before uh, you find them. Today is YC Demo Day for, I believe, uh, the summer 23 batch. How are you guys thinking about sort of the YC trade-off, the pressure and the evaluation expectations, and incorporating that back into your own methodology as early stage investors when coaching your own uh, portfolio companies or talking to new founders about raising capital? I'm not anti-YC at all. I, I think they've done a great job. Uh, kind of building their their program and their accelerator and their network, which is why founders go there, right? So, you know, the way I think about it is we will look at YC opportunities. Most of them will be out of range for us, but that's okay. And we will do certain deals that are out of range for us. And that's why we have a a, a more diversified strategy, right? We can take those bets on teams we love, even though they end up being a little bit more expensive. We won't do all of them, but we may do one or two here and there, right? So I think overall, the way we think about it is exactly what we were saying earlier. We have to cast these founders before they go to YC. And if we don't cast them before YC, it's unlikely we do those deals. But every now and then, like last year, we did, I think, two YC deals. This year, we've done one. And so I think we'll stu- still do them because they do attract a great cohort of, of founders and, 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 and companies. So we're not going to ignore it. We're going to learn from it. We're going to look at the trends uh, that come out of the YC cohorts. We, my, my colleague, Sarah, in fact, yesterday or the day before, presented to our team a summary of all YC companies in the current batch. What are they building? Where are they building? How are they building it? And which trends are they building? And it's great learning experience for us and rest of our team and you know, part of it is learning, part of it is deal sourcing, and, and some of it is just just see what YC does. I also saw a tweet on how many .dot AI uh, startups <laughs> were in the YC batch, but that wasn't the craziest part. What was the craziest part was how much increase in uh, GDP it brought for the .dot AI domain name, which is, I believe, the uh, Anguilla is the uh, Internet Country Code uh, domain name .dot AI. And the increase in revenue that the country received was like an incredible, like 75% growth. And a lot of it was attributed to the YC startups. That's a pretty cool stat. I, I like that. I was, I, I was joking with a lot of our founders who are in the market fundraising. I was like, first of all, I want to know if you own your .ai domain. 
because you better go buy it right now. <laughs> it, it's a half, half joke, half truth. Exactly. It's half joke, half truth. And, 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 and the you know, founders get that signal and some of them did go buy the domains just for, for their own sanity. Uh, but man, there's just incredible amount of hype in it. It's real, but every technology goes through it, its cycle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just like Dot ETH did, you know, only a year ago. But you know, speaking of combating the YC, also, you guys recently hosted the Founder Fuel event in Montreal. So, congrats on that. It looked like a phenomenal event. I watched the demos. In fact, one of our uh, co-investment companies, Artemis, one of our fellow fund checks, was there to present. So, maybe explain to the audience, you know, who aren't very familiar with Founder Fuel, what it is. Uh, explain sort of how it differentiates from the other accelerator programs out there. And maybe the benefit it provides to the team of Panache. Man, it was what, what an experience. It was our first time being involved in an accelerator. It's, it's, it's an experiment for us. And, uh, you know, most people don't know this. Founder Fuel is probably the only Canadian founded and, 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 and raised accelerator, right? There are not that many. You, you see Techstars, which is an import. You see a lot of YC founders here. It is the longest running early stage venture accelerator in Canada. Around for over a decade, I think. And during the pandemic, they took a hiatus uh, for a few years. And, and then Real Ventures was looking for partners to help them run it this year. Um, and so we teamed up with Inovia, Real, and the Founder Field team to get involved with this program this year. My partner, Scott Long, and, uh, and the team in Montreal were, were uh, deeply involved in screening and and bringing on the cohort and providing coaching and, and programming to them. Uh, so all in all, I think it was a great experience. What differentiates them uh, beyond being, being, being Canadian and, and being local, they do spend a lot of time on programming. And so YC, for example, is more network-based accelerator. Uh, you go there for the network, you learn from the network, a lot of peer-to-peer, -peer, a lot of mentoring. Founder Fuel has a little bit more structured programming in many ways. They do focus a lot on fundraising and business model and and helping founders think through their business plans uh, while providing the network and the mentorship around it. Uh, so I think it's the only real Canadian alternative to you know a YC or a 500 or, or or tech stars. And so yeah, pretty happy with how it went. Uh, you know, really good feedback from the community and the founders. And uh, yeah, we're excited about 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 the program. Yeah, phenomenal. And our founders had a great time at the demo day and thought it was a great program with a lot of hands-on support. So kudos to building that up again. You know, speaking about the differences, you know, between Founder Fuel and some of the other accelerator programs and the Canadian focus on it, you know, maybe you can explain some differences and challenges you've observed in the Canadian startup ecosystem compared to other regions and how you're trying to flip the script on those challenges with your team at Panache. Yeah, it's funny. This just this morning, Matt, as I was looking through some of your questions, um, I I went back to 2015 data of CVCA because that's when I went full time into venture, and I looked at kind of the growth in venture deployment, five x. Our industry, the venture ecosystem, and the dollars deployed have grown five x from 2015 to 2022. It is just unbelievable, and it is amazing. I am hyper, super bullish on the Canadian ecosystem. Uh, I'm biased, of course, because that's core to my strategy, but, but, you know, I'm just sharing kind of some of my thoughts here. What works really well, uh, is we've got great talent here, great engineering schools. I think we have immigration policies, which are quite favorable, uh, to the tech sector. We'll do another podcast on housing if you want to talk about immigration housing, <laughs> but I stay away from political, uh, political topics and all of that combined with the venture dollars with Vicky programs, new venture funds being created. U.S. capital, international capital coming in, and just sheer ambition of Canadian founders, the ecosystem's grown tremendously over the last, call it, you know, five to 10 years. I, I think some of the challenges remain where we lack talent is comes to growth, sales, scaling, right? So when you look, when we look at a deal in Canada versus a deal in the U.S., the deal in Canada or a team in Canada would have some great technical co-founders and a business co-founder. And a, and a and relatively similar deal in the U.S. may have that plus a co-founder who's sold into that industry many, many times or has the right experience. So I, I think I think where uh, we need to learn and get better is, is attracting more sales, marketing, growth type of talent into these companies early on. I mean, yeah, of course, you can hire VP sales. Of course, you can hire VP marketing and all of that. But I'm saying like experienced talent that, that has scaled businesses from zero to 100, right? So... 
So I think we'll get there, and and that ties into my 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 next comment on kind of some of, some of our challenges is is we need to show more exits, we need to show more DPI to to your comment earlier. Not only because it's important to show those returns to LPs, but it's also creates recycling effects for the ecosystem. You have you know, these founders who exit then become angel investors or they become an LP in a fund or they end up starting a new company. And so it has a lot of effects into our ecosystem, not only returns, but talent, capital. And so I, I think as we, as we mature and grow as an ecosystem, I am, I'm very hopeful and confident that we'll see more and more of these exits, maybe not over the next year or two, but they will come. I would say those are some of the areas of improvement. I think another area of improvement would be, uh, you know, more support for emerging managers. So, you know, listen, let's let's talk about Vicky since since we're on that chain, anyways. When Vicky and Vcat was established early on, I, I like I think it was great. It was a very strategic bet to jumpstart a venture ecosystem. But it, that strategy hasn't really evolved. Now, if you look at the last few programs, I feel like the money always goes to the same five to ten funds, which is which is which is good because they probably deserve it. But I think we can be more tactical with with if we were going to do another Vicky, I think we need to be more tactical. We we got to focus on areas such as emerging managers. We got to find more money in climate tech, as an example, right? And so our deep tech is another example where there's not a lot of capital. So I think the program's been helpful uh, to the venture ecosystem. I, I think it's obviously the returns have been good. We need to innovate the venture ecosystem. And, and I think the mission and purpose of Vicky, VCAP, whatever it ends up being called, uh, really should be to create innovation, incentivize new managers and emerging funds so that we can continue to grow yeah, those are all great points. And one thing I would add on the uh, scale up side is showing exits is not only beneficial to the founders, to the investors and limited partners, but also those employees who took common shares in options to show them actual real life changing dollars. And I think what we don't do very well is allowing employees to have exits or secondaries to show real tangible DPI to themselves to encourage other Bay Street or, you know, high corporate ladder executives to want to jump ship to go work for that Series A or Series B company as a leader who sold into that industry to grow and helpfully backfill the salary or the bonuses that they were giving up from their corporate jobs, which the American ecosystem has done a tremendous job of. They have allowed early stage companies to raise more capital, to attract more talent, and to allow people to transact in their stock to create a, a sense of liquidity. And that's what allows the flywheel to continue to grow uh, is another thing that I think we need to focus more on here. And I don't like this old idea of like, well, why should we let employees sell up before companies? No, 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 it's all together. It's not one before the other. It's everyone can win together by having a more fluid ecosystem. Um, so I agree with you 100%. I think it's a very important point where you're mentioning here. Uh, like, just think about the affordability issues in, in Toronto, right? And and you've got these entrepreneurs and early employees who are grinding day in and out. Man, they can't even afford to buy a condo in the city. You know, providing this liquidity options through their journey, I think it's a great comment. I think it's it should be it should happen more hopefully and and we should we should promote it. I mean the 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 capital gains exemption is just over a million now. It's 10 million for the QSBS in the US. We need to catch up to them there. We have founders just like you do in your portfolio that have 10 million, 20 million dollars worth of options or shares in their businesses that are valid but not liquid and they don't even have enough money to buy a condo like you say. And that's something that agree we need to find ways to help facilitate and lubricate the ecosystem to allow for a more free transfer of sort of like shares, employees, wealth, all those kinds of things. You know, looking ahead, what are your goals for the future of Panache and the continued contributions to the Stark ecosystem upon everything else we've talked about today? I have to say, I, I'm so grateful to be here just talking to you and both of us being in this industry. I mean, it really is a dream and I am just very excited and very optimistic for our ecosystem long term. I think when we look at Panache, we want to be a billion dollar fund. Yes, it will take multiple funds for us to get there. Uh, but the way we think about our fund is we're 
the top of funnel for the Canadian ecosystem. We, that's true to our core and our mission, and we live it day in, day out. And so for us, it's important that we continue to stay focused at the stage, which is pre-seed and early seed, and continue to build our funds so that great operators and entrepreneurs have smart money behind them. And so I think our long-term vision remains to be a billion-dollar fund one day. I think we will have you know, other funds along the way, maybe uh, a secondary fund now that you've planted that idea in my head or, a, or some sort of uh, an opportunity fund since the timing is pretty good over the next year. You know, I, I think for us, what's important is we continue to support Canadian entrepreneurs and continue to work with the ecosystem to build a, uh, a healthy ecosystem for all of us. And, and listen, it's, as I think about Canada long term, we used to manufacture cards and sell them to the U.S. Like long, long term, we will continue to build digital products and sell elsewhere, right? That's, that's going to be core to our GDP long term. So, so I, I think we want to grow with the ecosystem. We want to support it and, and we'll be there to help these founders eventually exit and, uh, and, and start that recycle uh, phenomena we're talking about. I agree with you, Prashant. It is a dream uh, to be able to do something like this passionate and supportive towards helping other founders, you know, fulfill their dreams and create the next great corporations uh, and uh, wealth in this country is uh, is definitely a dream. And so excited to be along the ride with you for many more years. You know, before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorite. So first off, your favorite podcast. It's it's funny you ask me that. My friends and my wife always ask me, you know, what's your favorite? So I, I tell folks that I'm a, I'm a man of many interests. So my favorites are usually based on recency bias. So I will tell you <laughs> what I've been doing recently, less so what's my the favorite, uh, but, but, but let's run through it. So, so podcast, regardless of one's opinion on Chumath, I, I do love the, the all in podcast. I've been, I've been chiming in every now and then. I think they have a pretty good banter on US politics, economics and tech. So I, I think for me, it's a one place that I can, I can try and get all of that. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. Uh, so recently, I signed up for the MIT Technology Review. I think um, they have a few different variations of it. They they do a pre they do a, I think it's a weekly newsletter, but they do a weekly newsletter on. There's one called Algorithms, which is more on AI and, and and computing. I think there's one on politics in in the Valley and so on. So I don't keep up with all of them. They're like five different newsletters, but um, I re- I've been recently kind of looking through it and reading it, and it's pretty cool. I think they. They do a pretty good job uh, of, of doing those newsletter. That's awesome. Next is your favorite tech gadget. My wife and I have a debate on this, but m- mine right now is the iRobot, uh, mainly because I want to automate all of the chores out of my life. You know, we have a de- constant debate on, on whether it's worth it or not. I think it is. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But uh, it's a pretty cool gadget. It uh, does, it does the job. So I have I, I have the iRobot uh, Roomba, and I named it Rosie after obviously uh, the Jetsons. That's good. I like that. Talk to <laughs> when I talk to Alexi Alexa in my house, I'll say, "Hey Alexa, start Rosie," and my wife hates it because she thinks like it's just so funny that I'm telling our 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 maid to start cleaning the house. Next is your favorite new trend. Uh, favorite? Uh, well, we were talking about YC. So how about twenty million post money casts or pre product market companies? Isn't that a new trend? I don't know if it's my favorite new trend, but it's definitely a new trend. <laughs> I told you, man, I'm going with the recent, recent, recency bias. Next is your favorite book. I, I don't know if it's my all-time favorite, but it, it is one of my favorites. Um, it's a book by Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. And, and I look back at it every now and then. You know, it's a pretty interesting book. Talks about how emotions get in the way of decision making and, and when people or why people choose to ignore probabilities or, or math. And, uh, you know, it applies to many things. It applies to our day-to-day life. It applies to business. Uh, I think it's a pretty well-written book. It's, uh, it's a cool story. So yeah, I like, I like that one. Perfect. And last but not least, your favorite life lesson. So there are, man, there's so many life lessons. Uh, one day I'll, I'll share them all. But, but the, 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 the more appropriate or timely one right now would be the way I think about myself sometimes is you, you, you've got to stay in the game before you win it. What I mean by that is like over the next year or so, there will be challenges in our industry. Entrepreneurs are going to struggle. VCs are going to struggle to raise money. But sometimes you just have to do enough to stay in the game. Because if you can stay in the game, then you'll get another shot of winning down the road. And so 
you know, I've been thinking about that a little bit. And for me is, is, is has been a life lesson in the past and in some of my, you know, personal ups and downs. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I thought I would share here today. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Staying in the game, especially at our early stages, emerging managers is is the name of the game. As long as you didn't say man in the arena, I was going to be okay with it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> A little hat tip to Chamath there. But thanks for joining us in the tank today with Prashant Mata, GP at Panache Ventures. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. And hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Matty B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time, 